How's it going everyone? Welcome back to the channel and to this video which I feel is long overdue. Uh, it's something I haven't done before and I feel the time is right. Straight line missions seem to be kicking off a bit. There's been a real spike in the uh, number of mainly young guys, let's be honest, who are going out there and attempting their own straight line missions. I have been inundated with emails from people asking me all sorts of advice from how do I plot my route to what counts as a straight line mission to what gear should I bring to what GPS should I bring and so on and so on and alongside that we're all seeing a lot more attempts uh, from budding straight line missioners being uploaded onto YouTube with varying degrees of success I think it's fair to say so I thought I'd make a little video uh, offering the best of my advice now I'm no adventure expert I'm not someone who can claim to be an expert when it comes to things like rock climbing, mountaineering, kayaking and things like that. Generally adventuring in, in exotic places, I have very little experience. But I have done a lot of straight line missioning and I've got a lot of experience planning them and doing them. And let me tell you, they're not easy. But if you are one of the people who are thinking about doing one or going to do one, Hopefully, by the time you've watched this video, you'll be a lot better prepared. So, here are my 15 top tips for completing a successful straight line mission. Number one is quite a simple one, really, quite a broad one, and that is simply to be realistic. Don't bite off more than you can chew, especially if you've never really done outdoor adventures before. Okay, you're going to have to pick a line, aren't you? You're going to have to pick a country, um, possibly, to do this across. And it's very easy, because I did it originally, to be a bit deluded and to think, yeah, I can do this, without really knowing what you're in for. Um, these missions are hard. They take a lot of planning. They take a lot of willpower. If you're doing it on your own and you're camping out on your own for several nights, you need to seriously be honest with yourself um, about whether that's something you can cope with because it's lonely, it's morale crushing, okay? So these are things you need to consider. The solution to this, I would say, is maybe do a mini one first. You know, do a two-day, doesn't have to be a straight line mission, but maybe go for a two-day hike and camp out on your own with the tent. Just see how it feels. And if you can cope with it fine and you get a real adventurous kick out of it, then you're good to go. If you come home thinking, oh God, that was horrible. and I don't want to do that again. Then you won't want to do the straight liner. Be honest with yourself. Be realistic. Number two. Oh, I've been looking for that. Google Earth is your planning mecca. Here we are on Google Earth, guys, and I should just point out before I continue to sing its praises, I've never really used anything else, okay? So I'm sure some of you will point out in the comments that there are better programs to use, most of which you probably have to pay for, um, but even then, I'm sure there are other free programs that you can use, software, um, that's equally as good as Google Earth. I don't know. I'm just telling you, Google Earth is great. It enables me to, to find out so many things about my potential line. You've seen on GeoDetective the things that you can find out on Google Earth. Um, and yeah, it's free, it's easy to use. But for those of you who haven't really used it, let me just show you some of the features um, that you can use that can really help you with your line. Let's say we're planning a line across Luxembourg. First things first, obviously you've got the bird's eye imagery, right? The satellite imagery. You can see, oh that was good, we've just shaved the bottom of that house there. And uh, that's the sort of thing you can see in detail as you can, as you can see. We'll turn the terrain off. We'll get to the terrain in a minute. Yeah, that one's pretty obvious. You can see whereabouts you're going exactly, places to camp, obstacles you might come across, right? Wow, this is an incredible line I've just accidentally done. Oh, maybe not. But we know that because of the crisp satellite imagery we have on Google Earth, right? And it can be quite up to date as well. The next feature is terrain, okay? And I'm gonna come to steep gradients later in this video, but it's very useful to be able to see how steep certain things are gonna be. 
Maybe Luxembourg isn't the best example. Two sex. Here's a better example. We're in Scotland and I've drawn a line across Scotland and you can clearly see that some of these mountains are pretty big and pretty steep. What if you want to take a closer look at that though? Well, you've always got the little yellow man, which we can put down on a road, has to be on a road of course, and we can take a look. We can see there's a railway track here straight away, which I didn't notice at first glance from above. And we can also make out that that looks pretty damn steep. Is it doable? Maybe, maybe not. But you get a much better view from the road and you'll get an even better view if you go to Google Maps because you can actually zoom in and out on that. Google Earth doesn't let you do that, to be fair. There are plenty of other features as well on Google Earth, including the timeline feature, which lets you look in the past, um, which can sometimes be useful. You can move through the years um, at different imagery. And another thing that I find really useful on Google Earth is photos. And it's pretty obvious, really. Some of you may have done this. If you want to check out, I don't know, what this farm's like, there might be a photo of it. There it is. There's alpacas. Beware of the alpacas if you're crossing through this farm. Um, if there's a mountain side or a valley you want to see, very often there's... There's photos of them, so you can see the steepness. There you go, look, that's quite useful. Okay, so don't go over that, basically. Um, but again, you need experience to, to, to be able to look at that and go, nope, that's too dangerous. Going there in real life would be better. Number three, and we're staying on Google Earth. Okay, so you're gonna put your preliminary line down and you can with a small country like Luxembourg, certainly, you can kind of see roughly where you might want to go. Okay, not in the towns, basically. I don't know, let's try that, right? Kind of looking, I'm trying to avoid the towns. But it's the tweaking. Tweaking is key. Tweak till your heart's content. So, here we go, I've zoomed in more, and I've gone back south of that house that we were at earlier. And the tweaking can go on for hours, guys. It really can, um, because... If you think about it, there's unlimited possibilities, almost. Um, if you change either side of the line, you can come from different angles. You can go further north, further south. Here we've hit a couple of towns, which is just not doable. So I've got to rethink things. I've got to go further south altogether. How about there, just south of Redange? That looks a bit better. That looks doable. Yeah but we've gone through Berg, so I need to tweak that slightly on the right side now. Rest of it looks good. What if I go there? Do we avoid Berg now? Kind of, yeah. I like that. There's a couple of houses there, but you know, a couple of houses is workable. A whole village is not workable. I'm not gonna create a whole new straight line for you right now, guys, because it takes a while, but hopefully you can see what I mean. The secret is in the tweaking and in some countries it feels like an impossible task uh, to tweak and miss any villages. Uh, Netherlands is, is one of them. It's almost impossible because it's so built up with farms and towns and motorways. Well that's a whole different thing. Um, but some countries you'll find it easier to tweak than others. Number four, and we're very much staying on Google Earth here, and it's beware of steep gradients. Now, unless you're in a rainforest or a desert or something, steep gradients are the most likely danger on your straight line mission. And I say that in part because if you want to avoid farms and built up areas, which I think a lot of people would, depends what kind of character you are, you're gonna wanna move to less inhabited areas, wilder areas, and more often than not, those wilder areas have mountains in them, or at least hills, such as this line I quickly knocked up in the north of Scotland. Now, it's telling us on Google Earth that we've got a maximum slope here of 56.9, which is on the cusp of what I would consider safe, but it depends on a few things. But it's irrelevant. That is not an accurate reading. That is, I believe, going off the slopes that we see here on the 3D feature, and they're not accurate. 
There could easily be a four or five meter cliff somewhere around here uh, that it doesn't pick up. It doesn't zoom in that far to that level of accuracy, okay? And as a result, you can't use this. You just can't. I tried to do it in Wales 1 and look where it got me. If you were serious about doing a line through mountains like this one, um, you would need to somehow get your hands on a specialist who has access to very advanced GIS software, um, LiDAR imagery preferably, that can give you an accurate reading for the meter, each meter. Now I have a guy who does that for me, but he's busy, he won't do it for anyone else. Um, there are ways that you could maybe do it yourself, I'm not sure, it depends how savvy you are with this kind of stuff. But if you don't, and especially if you're not experienced on steep gradients or you know mountaineering, don't bother doing a line through mountainous areas. It's as simple as that. Because what's going to happen is you're going to come up to somewhere that has a really steep gradient and you're either going to try it and get yourself killed or you're going to break your leg or you're just going to end up going round anyway, which I would firmly recommend. Another thing you can do if you think there is something that might be steep and might be of concern on your line is you could go and scout it out. And again, this depends on how thorough you want to be in your planning, how much time you want to invest into this and money ultimately. But me and Greg did that in Scotland. We went and scouted out a couple of steep drops and we concluded that they were okay. Now I've had a couple of people mention places like Andorra, Austria. You know, why don't you do that? Well, I just think it's way too mountainous. I've knocked up a, a, a fairly decent looking line here that avoids the main towns. And I just think mountains of this size would be way too dangerous and I think what you'd probably have to do with a, a line like this is have a much bigger leeway okay so you'd have to have a, a leeway either side of about 100 meters so you'd look at the country and go right that's a really hard country platinum is unrealistic gold is unrealistic but silver might be doable because otherwise it's just going to be too dangerous and I think if we put the man down somewhere around here do you know, it doesn't look quite as bad as I thought that might be doable. I don't know. Um, but I think inevitably, what's this like? Yeah, that doesn't look great. I think inevitably on a country like Andorra or Austria, you're going to come to... Austria, definitely. They're, they're huge mountains. You're going to come to some gnarly bits. And I would say don't even consider it unless you're an experienced... More experienced than me, that's why I haven't done it. Um, mountain climber, scrambler, that sort of thing. And definitely have a larger leeway, because 25 meters ain't gonna happen. Back we go to Scotland, everyone, for number five, and it's lake and river crossings. Let's say you've picked this line then. Uh, you've avoided the worst of the mountains, but the cost for that is you have to cross a big lake. This is fairly simple. Um, you need an inflatable kayak or a kayak, and you're gonna need to stash it as well. There's not really much getting around that. I mean, it depends how big the body of water is, right? If it's a, very, you know, if it's a river that's not very fast flowing, it's not very wide, or even a, a small pool or lake, maybe you could do it on a paddleboard like me and Greg uh, did in Scotland, or a smaller boat, inflatable boat with oars. But I still wouldn't recommend carrying that in your bag because it's going to make your bag too heavy. But we'll come to that later in this video. Pack weight. Really, if you're planning this properly, if you really are serious about succeeding, it's going to take a lot of planning. And part of that planning is stashing your inflatable kayak. Because if a lake is big and it's choppy, it's got big waves on it, the wind is perhaps blowing against you, you need to be able to pick up some speed. You need to cut through those waves as I was just about able to do on Lake Vernwy and in Norway, okay? I had the speed so that it didn't matter about the wind and the waves, I could cut through them. And that made it safe because I was able to get to the end. Well, yeah, I was able to get to the end basically and not be blown back or capsized. And on the safety note, you want to also have life jackets, okay? I tried it without life jackets on Lake Vernwy and it was scary. Okay, because I was very aware that if I fell in that lake and, you know, the wind blew the kayak off, 
I probably would have drowned. Is it worth that? Dying a horrible, icy cold death on a Welsh lake for the sake of a straight line mission? No. But even safety aside, you want this thing to run smoothly. You want to get across that lake, if it's a lake of this size, as quickly as you can because it's not very nice. It's cold, it's wet, um, you're being dripped on. It kills your back and your arms. Um, you want to get across there quick. So invest in some sort of kayak, uh, get it stashed, and bag yourself the easiest four miles of the entire line. That brings us fairly nicely onto number six, which is stashes are king. Yep, unless you have a saint of a girlfriend like Verity, who's willing to drive around for you and uh, meet you at various points, uh, making the stashes redundant, then I would strongly recommend doing stash points on anything. On anything that's further than 30 miles, I would say it's a must. An absolute must. This is the 40 mile long Scotland line that me and Greg attempted. Here are the stash points. And we did stash all of these. I've explained this in the videos for you uh, a couple of times, but without these stashes, this line would be impossible. Um, and even if it was technically possible, you know, nothing's impossible, but I cannot stress how much easier it would be with them. Hundreds times easier. And pretty much the main reason for that, although there are other reasons, but the main reason is pack weight. Your pack, depending on how big you are, doesn't want to be much more than 8 to 10 kilograms. Less if you can. Mine and Greg's bags were 8 kilograms each. And that's because at every stash point we had 3 litres of water, all of our food for that evening and the next day, and a few other bits and bobs like batteries, uh, spare socks and spare pants. And that enabled us to move quickly and get over fences quickly, which by God we needed to, and potentially escape farmers. Now I don't think I need to convince you that if my pack was one kilogram heavier or even 500 grams heavier, I don't think we would have escaped the farmer in Wales 3. That was literally the difference between succeeding and failing. So if you're serious about doing a really successful straight line mission, um, this is something you have to do. You have to stash. Imagine how much all of your food alone would weigh for these five days. Water, it is possible just to get by on a water filter and not stash water. It's possible depending on uh, which country you're in, how many water sources there are. Maybe in the Scottish Highlands or the Welsh Hills you could do it, but it is slower. It's going to take more time to do the mission. In a hot country like Portugal, where there ain't gonna be a lot of water sources, surely you need to stash water. I think that would be a definite. So pack weight is crucial. I haven't even touched on the comfortableness of it. I mean, have you tried walking up and down mountains with a 15 kilogram pack? If you're ex-army paratrooper, then yeah, that you're not gonna have a problem with that. But if you haven't done this sort of thing before, you do not wanna be doing that. It's hell. You've got enough on your plate. You don't want a huge pack, trust me. So stashes are great, but I would argue support is better uh, for various reasons. You can get your batteries charged. You can get a more specific item. You know, maybe you need some Compede one day or an ankle support, right? So support definitely beats stashes. Um, actually, the main reason for that is that you might not reach your stash. You might get held up or you might reach it too soon which means you have to carry a load of stuff with you on your back for another five miles or so. Support has all the benefits of stashing, uh, but is more flexible and makes it a hell of a lot easier. So to sum up, if you're lucky enough to be able to stash, if you've got the time and the money and the vehicle to do it, do it. And if you're even luckier than that and you can have a support, definitely take advantage. Number seven is a simple one. Winter is best, and in many countries, winter is the only way. If I was to try a straight line mission across Wales in the summer, well, I wouldn't do it. Would not do it. Why? 
Well, not only have you got the heat, the flies, the midges, the bugs, the bees, the hay fever, but I believe it's made almost impossible by two other factors. The foliage, so brambles, ferns, stinging nettles, would make it living hell and would turn your body into a scratched up, puffed up, red, sweating, itching mess. I don't think mentally many people could take that. And the other, perhaps even more decisive reason, is crops. Now there aren't many crops in Wales, that's something you'd have to check. It's mainly sheep fields in Wales, but if you were to do it in somewhere like the Netherlands in the summer, there is no way in hell you're avoiding crops. So anyone who's thinking of doing a mission in the summer, find out if there's any crop fields. And if you think trampling crops is fine, think again. Winter does have its downsides. You know, it's cold for one. Uh, on Wales too, me and Greg were absolutely freezing. Uh, it got to minus three on the nights and it was very unpleasant. We didn't get much sleep because we didn't have the right equipment for it. It can rain a lot. It can be miserable and cold, but it's doable. The perfect time in Britain. It's going to vary from country to country. I mean, I did Norway in the summer because it was so far north. There was no crops. There was no brambles. It was fine. But I'm talking about Britain, Central Europe. Perfect time, I would say, Feb, March. Number eight. Fuck, we're still only halfway through, pretty much. Uh, I'll try and speed things up. What GPS should I use? Well, I use these. Actually, no, I've got a newer one. I did use that for a few missions, but I've upgraded to this. Now, you could probably spend more money and get a better model, perhaps. I don't know, I'm not an expert. And you could probably spend less money and get a slightly worse one. But I think, I get the sense that this is a really good all-round option. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, it let us down, but I don't think it did. I'm pretty sure that it was the batteries that let us down, which is heartbreaking in Wales 3. I'm sorry if I've ruined that for you, but you should be up to speed by now if you're watching this. Um, they're rugged. They, The batteries on them <laughs> are supposed to last. Um, they're just boots batteries that I used in the end. And they ended up lasting easily all day. It didn't even go down one bar on the last day. So that's what they should last. They're easy to use. They The 65S has great signal from uh, three different types of satellite. It's got good signal. It's never going to be perfect if you're in a canyon or in a forest. But basically, this is an all-round good device. It really is. And once you've mastered how to set up your route which you do on the software that it comes with, which is called Garmin Basecamp. It's not the best software, and you have to download bird's eye imagery to get onto this thing. It's a bit of a faff, but it's doable. It's not that hard to work out. And once you've worked it all out, you're set. You've got a workhorse. It's, you can drop it in water. Uh, it, it won't let in water. It's rugged. I mean, you can. I've dropped it so many times, it's unbelievable. If you're serious about doing a straight line mission and you can afford it, I would recommend it. But then I haven't used much else. So there might be perfectly good alternatives. I presume you want to film and document your mission. I think it would be a real crying shame not to because who knows what might happen um, now from what I can tell GoPros are the best bet there are competitors but from what I've read on reddit and other reviews GoPros are the best however they're not perfect by any means uh, you've probably seen on my videos that they glitch up a lot 
I've been using the GoPro Hero 7. There's a 10 out now, but I, apparently it's dread. I mean, the reviews are awful in terms of it overheating and glitching up, which would be, I mean, this one's bad enough, but the Hero 7, when it's not glitching out, which is usually because of cold weather, um, I can't fault it to be fair. When it gets wet and cold, it is very temperamental. But a lot of the time, if you change the battery to a, a fresh, fully charged battery, it can sort it out. I would recommend the GoPro Hero 7 on a trip like this. Um, it shoots in 4K, although that will eat up your juice and your memory. Um, I've been filming now on the past few missions, ironically since the first one, which I did shoot in 4K, in 1440, um, which is pretty damn good quality. I take a load of these little 64 gigabyte memory cards with me. I take enough for sort of five hours footage a day, probably more actually, just to be safe. I take a load of these. They are the GoPro batteries. I have about 26 of those, although I've lost a couple. 26 of those I had in my um, backpack on the first mission across Wales, which weighed a bit of a ton, to be honest. Since then, I've got Verity to offload them to me incrementally and charge them as we go. These aren't cheap. The SD cards aren't cheap. The GoPro isn't cheap. These aren't cheap. It all adds up. And I think this is the kind of the point I want to make to you, which Marcus found out the hard way. If you want your mission to be a genuine success, if you are ambitious and you want to really cross a country and be on that record list, if you like, if, if there is such a thing, it ain't cheap. Number 10, the better equipped you are, in other words, the more you spend, basically, the higher your chances of success. If you've got a good GPS, good tent, good kayak, nice lightweight dehydrated food, and I'll refer you to the pack list video, by the way, uh, that's going to be in a separate video, uh, but I'll touch on it briefly now. Nice thick sleeping bag, so you can get a good night's sleep, and the same goes for a self-inflating mat, a dry bag. A proper good dry bag that holds everything in for river crossings. Good boots. Nice thorn proof ripstop clothing. A satellite phone if you're really serious about it, which I'm starting to be. Um, and you know, other costs. A hotel. Do you need to stop in a hotel for a couple of nights? Do you need a rental car? Petrol? All of these things add up. But all of these things are going to increase your chances of success, basically. Now, I'm not suggesting you go out there and spend a shitload of dough, um, especially if you've never done this kind of thing before, but it might be better in your eyes to spend 800 quid and succeed than spend 400 quid and fail. It might be worth it for you. As I said, at the start of this video, these missions are really hard. Okay, I don't think uh, my edits do them justice. I don't think you can really get a feel for just how horrible they are at times um, on the silver screen. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And as, as time's gone on, I've realized that because it's so likely that you'll fail at any given point, the last thing you want is for your equipment to fail you, okay? You don't want to get 75% the way through and your GPS packs up. Wait, that happened to me. Um, you don't want to get halfway through and realize you can't cross a lake because you haven't got the proper kayak, for example. You don't want to have to give up halfway through because you're being torn to shreds by brambles. You know, you want to be prepared. And preparation means buying the right gear. Right, a lot of the questions I've been getting from people are to do with what counts as a straight line mission. And what I mean by that is, countries are funny shapes, so what counts as going across it? Let me show you what I mean. Luxembourg is a good example. That line that we drew earlier is definitely crossing Luxembourg, but if we walk this up to about I don't know, there, is that crossing Luxembourg? And my answer is, well, I, I wouldn't do that, if you want my actual answer. I, I would say that that is 
a cop out. I would say try harder, aim higher. Okay, in that in that specific case. But my point is, it's impossible to draw boundaries here. There are unlimited lines that you can draw from one side of an oddly shaped country to another, and I don't know what kind of maths formulas you'd have to work out to categorize all of these lines, but it wouldn't be easy. Um, I think my answer to this whole debate is use your common sense, okay? If you're gonna do Luxembourg and you're going from there to there, don't claim that you're crossing Luxembourg in a straight line. Don't put that as your title on YouTube, I don't know. Just say you're lopping the top of it off. Uh, there's a potential line across the Netherlands here from sort of there to there, which is 3.2 miles. Is that crossing the Netherlands? Not really, no. For me to cross the Netherlands, you'd have to go like that. Is that the sea there? Yeah, that's the sea. That would be crossing the Netherlands for me because you've still got a, a large, I don't know, a third of it north of you. Maybe we could have a loose rule where there has to be a quarter or a third of the landmass to the north or south of you. No, that wouldn't work because, and I'll show you, because Chile, that would be crossing Chile because it's thin the whole way down. That would be crossing Chile from there to there. Norway, I did that in Norway. So no, there are no fixed rules for this guys. Just use your common sense. It's kind of like the line purity thing or the line continuity thing in the sense that I think we're going to have to use our common sense a bit. In fact, let's move on to that point. Line purity. I'm not going to ramble about this for too much because I've done it enough already. We talked about it in the line review video. Some of you may not have seen that. What do I mean by line purity? Well, if you don't want to know the result for Wales 3, too late to look away now. You can see a full line there, can't you? That line is two lines stitched together. Days one, two, and three. Bizarre battery malfunction in the GPS and then returning and finishing it off, returning to the exact same point. That is not a continuous run. It's a segmented run. It was done in two efforts. And that, as we've discussed, is far less valuable than a continuous run. And many would argue a fail. However, as many of you have pointed out, quite rightly, what's stopping someone from doing day one one day, going home for a week, going to work, coming back, doing day two, and so on and so on. Nothing's stopping them from doing it, I suppose, and it pains me to say that they would have technically completed a line, but I think we're all in agreement here when I say that those sorts of efforts, although they do deserve credit for what they are, shouldn't be put in anywhere near the same category as a continuous one. And I think I mentioned on the line review video in a comment that ideally we would have categories for this, probably six or seven categories. Now I know that sounds like more confusion, but think about it, a platinum, completely continuous run, which means you don't leave the line to camp by more than 25 meters. That is the ultimate in straight line missioning. And unintentionally in continuous times one is what me and Ben would have done. You know, we had every intention of doing it continuously and we would have done, if not for one, technological mishap. And I think that is something that we just need to make clear on our videos, okay? We just need to be honest. If you're gonna upload a video, don't claim that you know you did it continuously when you didn't. But my final word on that is that continuous runs are the proper way. I will always be trying to do a continuous run. An intentionally incontinuous run for me, I would have no interest in doing that whatsoever. The final and perhaps the biggest point when it comes to success of line is deviations. Uh. Line purity is important, 
But this is actually more important if you think about it. I cannot put into words how much easier it would be to walk this line if you allowed yourself 100 meters each, each side of you. Until you've done one, you, you'll never fully know, but pretty much every field you could walk through a gate. Every forest you could dance around trees and bushes and brambles like they weren't there. Every farmstead you could go around. Every hedge you could find a really good gap. And if you got caught by a farmer, unless you were really unlucky, you'd probably be able to be marched off his land and stay within your boundary. It would be a piece of piss compared to this, let me tell you. Nothing would get in your way, basically. Why am I hammering this point home? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's important. I think if we are going to take uh, straight line missions seriously, like I do, for me, a straight line mission is a straight line mission. It means going in the straightest line you possibly can. Sometimes you have to deviate 20 meters so you don't get copped by a farmer. You have to make sure you survive. You don't want to get 90% the way through only to fail. You're bound to deviate a bit, but my point is there's a big difference between these sorts of wiggles and deviating 100, 200 meters. Now in Wales 1, I deviated 120 meters from the line in the first mile uh, because I hadn't paid attention to the weather and the river was raging, which is bad planning. And that gave me a Burdell score of zero. That alone would be enough to fail me. And I think that's, it's harsh but fair. It still would have been a success in, in oh so many ways if I'd have made it to the coast. And it was anyway, really. Uh, it depends how you define things. And I'm not trying to discourage people uh, from going out there and um, giving this a go. Um, but I think we also need, um, or rather I need, at least for myself, strict rules at the highest level to, to give this thing meaning, you know, because otherwise what would drive me on to the end on a broken ankle uh, if it wasn't for the meaning that I've, that I've attached to that highest form of success, you know? I don't know, why put parameters on anything? Why do anything? So yeah, deviation is important. If someone crossed, I don't know, England or Britain, um, in a straight line and it was on a newspaper article and they'd actually deviated like 250 meters and the reporters hadn't noted that, I will have noted that and I will not count that as the success that they perhaps do. I would count that as a fail because I could easily walk across England deviating 250 meters as I go. Anyway, that's deviations out the way. Uh, we're on to our last but one point. And we're winding down now, guys, from the technical stuff. And it's back to the more philosophical points. And this point is simply respect the land. You know, don't leave a mess when you're camping. Uh, don't damage hedgerows. Don't damage crops. Don't do either of those things. Don't walk across any crops, okay? That is costing farmers their livelihood. Uh, that's a no-brainer. Uh, no one's going to be impressed if you do that. Um, they'll just be angry, including me. Uh, when it comes to people's properties, I, I, you know, you'll probably laugh at me because I have run through people's gardens, but I like to think that I do respect people's property, believe it or not. Uh, I wouldn't run through the garden of an old lady, or anyone actually, if they were in there, if they were in the garden, I'd ask them, do you mind if I come through your garden? I wouldn't run through a load of gardens that had really tall fences, you know, because they're designed to keep people out. Also, there might be dogs in there. Um, yeah, I think just, again, common sense, be respectful. If there's someone there and they've asked you not to come through their garden, don't do it. Finally, guys, we're coming to the end of the video here. I hope it's been useful for you. Um, but the last thing I want to say to you, and I'm sure I've missed a couple of things out. I always do. 
Uh, I can already think of a couple of things I've missed, but it's too late. Uh, but the final point is, and this is probably the most important really, uh, is be safe. A lot of you will be really excited to embark on this new adventure, um, which I think is fantastic. You can't beat that feeling. Um, but a lot of you will be new to it. You won't be that experienced um, at hiking or mountaineering or the outdoors in general. A lot of your experience may have come from watching my videos, okay, which is <laughs> not the best source at times. All I'll say is, and this kind of ties back to the first point of don't bite off more you can chew. Um, if you have picked a route and it's ambitious, that's fine. But if you get to an obstacle, let's say there's a steep gradient, right? You're in a forest and it kind of drops off. Don't risk it. If you're unsure and you're looking down there and you're like, oh God, I can't really see down there. That looks quite steep. Don't risk it. Go round because... If you go round, you might deviate 20, 30, 40, 50 meters, but you'll still be alive or you'll still have your legs. You can live to fight another day. You can live to plot a better line. It is not worth risking your life over a straight line mission. And I know what you're thinking. Yeah, but you went through that bog. Yeah, that was stupid. And I wouldn't go near it again. Um, yeah, we all learn lessons and that was definitely one of them. That's the stupidest thing I've ever done. And I wish I'd have gone round by 10 metres. So I want you to do the same. I don't want you to risk your lives. And that's not just because I'll feel bad if something happens to you. I think it's the obvious, sensible and right thing to do. Okay, there is undoubtedly things I've missed out in this video and I apologise if your burning questions haven't been answered. Uh, but on the whole, I hope that this video has been of use to you. And yeah, budding adventurers, I wish you the best of luck. Don't give up when things get hard, okay? Because uh, you will reap the rewards, believe me. If you persevere, you'll find out what you're made of inside. And you'll become a man, my lad or lady. Um, but be safe, guys, and uh, happy missioning. See you soon.